because it's so fun. Uh, <laughs> I would think it would be easy. Um, I don't know. I do know that they do. You know, there, there's that phrase, I forget the, the name of the play, but it says that, you know, sex is a dirty, nasty, disgusting thing you should say for someone you love. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't, um, it is a taboo subject. And I think that that's unfortunate. But, um, uh, and, I'm, and here I'm thinking sexuality just broadly, not just about sex, but just as broadly as possible. But, um, but no, I mean, you know, to me, everybody has it. Everybody does it. Um, most people at some point in their life actually enjoyed it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, people call it a guilty pleasure. I don't see why it just can't be a pleasure pleasure. But I think practically everything has become less taboo. Um, you know, watch TV. Um, uh, so yeah, we are, uh, I, I think that we are, but, but we also need to, while moving forward, we need to also realize that, uh, all of these things mean different things to different people and we should be about liberating everyone and not just those who agree with us. Two reasons, uh, I would argue. One, uh, and I tell this to everybody, what I do is a luxury. I mean, you know, the, the ability to sit back and to think about these things and, and, and write about these things and publish and, and, and teach and talk about these things. It's a luxury. And so as a group, you know, black Americans have had a, a longer list of things to worry about and to deal with and to overcome. And I think for the majority populations, i.e. white populations, they didn't care. So when you have one group that doesn't care and then one group that's too busy to deal with it, it's easy for these things to sort of get pushed off to the side. And the same thing is true for Latino sexualities or for Asian or Native American or, or anything. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's a particular point and moment of, of, of luxury to think about it at that level. But um, uh, I think it's important to think about it because it can also easily be an issue of literally life and death. I mean, if you're talking about things, because uh, to me, wrapped up in that sexuality and sexual expression, you know, uh, if you do it from a public health, if you think about it from a public health perspective, there are things like HIV and AIDS. Uh, if you think about it from um, a women's right perspective, there's discussions around abortions and a woman's right to control her own body. Um, uh, if you think about it from a life course perspective, people's sexuality continue and is expressed and is understood literally throughout the life course. And it's a part of who people actually are. And so I, I think it's, it's, it's obviously, though it's a luxury to think about it, I think that it's not a luxury not to think about it. Well, most of what I focus on are um, uh, gay and lesbian populations uh, in, in the United States. That's, uh, at least I focus on at this point uh, in my career. And I think that the bulk of uh, my research is showing that within the black population, the, you know, there is no monolithic experience. There are multiple experiences. But among those things that tend to matter most, and this is no surprise, is money. I mean, you know, what people uh, think about, the issues that they wrestle with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. A friend of mine once said, no matter how much money you have, you will always have a conversation about money. The issue is, depending on how much money you have, that will dictate which conversation you have. And the, and the same thing is true concerning issues of sex and sexuality and, you know, expressions based on that. It, it's, you know, I, I think, the, you know, I think the origins were, you know, clearly from this uh, whole idea of, of uh, an effort to keep black men away from white women. I mean, that, that was at core what, what, the, what the hope, wish, and desire were. So that, that's where its origins were. How does that show up now, uh, uh, if you will? There's kind of a tacit agreement that uh, it, it never has to be languaged but it's extremely easy to tap into. And that is that, you know, um, you know, all black men want to screw white women or do something harmful to white women, and they must therefore, women must therefore be protected. Okay, well, based upon that alone, so we can see racism, we see patriarchy, we see sexism, we see, you know, misogyny, all sorts of things give rise in that scenario. And so when, um, um, there was an incident that happened a few years ago where a woman, unfortunately, you know, drove her children into uh, a river and claimed that, you know, a black man uh, carjacked her. 
uh, there, there are far too many reports in the media of where women um, um, talk about, or even men talk about, uh, they've beaten their own wives, if you will, and they claim that some black guy came along and did that. Well, that's a narrative you don't have to convince people of. All you have to do is simply tap into it, uh, uh, if you will. There is, um, uh, in this discussion of measuring things like racism, quite often, if you were doing a survey to see how racist a group of people were or in a certain region, you wouldn't say, hey, are you racist? That's a waste of breath. Because you know, only the, the most extreme moron would answer yes to that question. Uh, but one way you can get at that question is to basically say to someone, uh, how comfortable would you feel if you're talking to somebody who's white and in the South, let's say, in rural areas? How would you feel if your daughter brought home a black man? You know what I mean? Um, um, uh, and then you can begin to measure sort of comfort levels, something called feeling thermometers that they have in, in social science research. You can, um, uh, and that I think gets at it. And, and, and that exists all by itself. It doesn't take a lot to create it. It already exists. And all you have to do is just sort of tap into it. It's just, it's just there. I, I, again, I go back to probably in the um, uh, early 1600s uh, when there was this, if, if, in this country, in the, in the United States, um, where there was this desire, if you will, for those who had power, who were landowners, who were overwhelmingly white men, whose desire it was to maintain and to control uh, all of their property. And among their property, they clearly saw was also the women in their lives, you know, uh, uh, Seeing black people as property, that was easy. They already were property, that was clear. But uh, uh, in order to maintain control, uh, and so quite often when dealing with even women, the whole idea was, I'm trying to protect you, you know, from, from them, you know, that, that generalized other, that evil thing off to the side. And, you know, I, I don't think that that's, un unfortunately, you know, I don't think that that is completely gone. And when I say, gone again. I don't mean to imply there are people who wake up every morning and this is the first thing in their thinking. I don't mean to imply that. But there is an awareness, if, if you will. And it, and, it, and it goes both ways. I mean, when I say goes both ways, you know, it, it shows up both negatively, you know, and positively. This sort of controlling and displaying of, of, of bodies and the black male body and what that looks like through uh, sports and the black female body. And now we're seeing it uh, much more with Latino populations and Latinas. Um, uh, you know, Jennifer Lopez, uh, who I oftentimes point to, when she first, quote unquote, hit it big, she was uh, a, a raceless figure. And then once she became Latina, we then allowed for this space and opportunity for her to actually have a big ass, and it was a good thing. Beforehand, she was just this raceless person with a big butt, and she needed to get a smaller one. But as soon as, we, as, soon as that label of Latina was put onto her, she would not only had it, we, uh, as a culture, began to exploit it and look forward to it and magnify it and refer to it in, shall we say, bootylicious ways. I think that they uh, use the term they broke the notions of, of uh, traditional black sexuality. I wouldn't say they broke it. I would say they broadened it. And that's what made them uh, uniquely interesting characters because they controlled their sexuality, in the case of Bessie Smith, with both women and men. I mean, uh, uh, she controlled her sort of presentation of self, and it wasn't seen as uh, uh, a negative, if you will, because it was so masterfully done. And it was this sort of, uh, uh, I am in charge of what's going on. You know, I'm, a, I'm an actor, I'm, a, I'm just not being acted upon. And it was, you know, uh, to, 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 you know uh, who white did that very well? May, um, um, May West, you know, she did a great job, uh, if you will, of, of controlling it. And you knew any man she was with, she controlled him. She controlled the dynamics. She had the power of it. And so it was this sort of broadening and sort of creating space and license for women to say, you know, you don't have to just be, you know, acted upon. You can be an actor. And you can enjoy sex. You know, you can enjoy um, uh these broader expressions of sexuality. And up until that point, you know, there was sort of, you know, what a lady should do, 
And I guess that, there, that these women came along and said, okay, there's what you say a lady should do, and then there's what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, un until we, uh, 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 until our culture comes up with an equivalent term that is pejorative for men who sleep around, will forever, you know. You know, we, we, we talk about man whores or, or whatever, but it still doesn't have the same level of negative connotation, uh, if you will. You know, in the very place that you work in, if, if, if there was a, a gentleman who, you know, had slept with three or four of the ladies who work here, you know, that sort of thing, we might call him a dog. We might think, you know, uh, we might investigate the circumstances of those relationships. Conversely, if there was a woman who slept with four of the guys here, it's a short conversation. She's a slut. We're done. <laughs> it's, like, it's funny you should say that because I haven't given this much thought because my, my sentiment is, uh, except for Tiger Woods, who, who, by the way, I'm still telling everyone, don't forget, he said he was not black, so don't, don't push him off on us. But look, here, here's a... Because <laughs> anybody that's stupid, I don't... Please, no, we got enough problems. But, uh, 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 you know, Elliot Spitzer, um, uh, John Edwards, Tiger Woods, you know, all these ministers um, uh, in the Midwest and Colorado and who, you know, keep getting caught, you know, with the pants down, if, if, if you will. My argument is what they're doing is the human experience. They're not doing anything different than what everybody else is doing. So then why do we care? Why, why, what, what, are, what are they tapping into that causes this? And I think that there's, again, this tacit agreement about how these things should be done, if you will. And they're exposing the fact that that's not true. There's this sort of, uh, you know, of course, you know, we all cheat, but we don't get caught. And we don't do stupid things like leave ridiculous messages on a, a voicemail, you know, of a cocktail waitress out of Vegas. Could you be more cliche, for heaven's sake? <laughs> you know? And so that's where I think this sort of, uh, uh, this pushback, that we have to give this public perception that we disagree with someone engaging in the same behavior that I, too, engage in. I, I, I think because, again, back to the point that um, uh, I'm not saying women don't cheat. Don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, when you say just as much, uh, that's where the variable comes into play. Uh, uh, I think that, again, there is this cultural expectation and this cultural standard that there are certain things a woman should do, if you will. If you talk to, you know, an average guy, if he meets a woman and, you know, if you meet a woman at 2 o'clock, uh, 2 a.m. on a Wednesday in a bar and she goes home with you and has sex, that's the kind of woman that goes home with people at 2 a.m. on Wednesday in a bar and has sex with people. And he'll enjoy that. But this is probably not someone he wants to hang out with for a very long period of time, if, if you will, because of, of, of these cultural standards, norms, and that sort of thing. Conversely, I think from the, from the uh, man's end, you know, he could probably go home and, you know, tell most of his friends, oh, my God, I went, you know, I went out to the bar. I met this woman. We went and, and had sex. There would be no judgment around that activity, but there would be judgment around if he then said, oh, and I asked her to marry me. <laughs> See, they would look just like you are right now. <laughs> Hillary Clinton. I, I, I discovered years ago that uh, I used to do some uh, polling work and, and stuff for her when she was running for the Senate the first time uh, here in New York. And uh, I remember uh, talking to people who had organized some of these focus groups among white women. And that was the first time I had ever been exposed to this sort of, I'll call a bimodal distribution of white women when it comes to Hillary Clinton. Either they loved her unconditionally or they wanted her hit by a bus and they wanted to be the ones driving the bus. And I was shocked by this. I thought that there was a, you know, you know, we all love, you know, all white women love all white women, and so therefore everybody don't get along. And I was like, what, 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 what's, what's going on? <laughs> it just, it threw me off. And I felt like Karen on Will and Grace. What's, what's, what's going on? And so here's my theory. I can't prove it, but here, you know, but here's my theory. There's a tacit agreement, if you will, uh, a prescriptive ethic, what ought to happen, 
So in the descriptive ethic, what does happen? I'm still talking about Holy Cross. The prescriptive ethic is if you're with a man and he cheats on you, you leave him. Period. That's it. Hillary, her man cheated. We all heard about it. We all knew about it. I mean, it was an international sensation. And Hillary didn't leave. Well, quite frankly, most women don't leave. They just don't. Because if, if most women left, you know, they say 50% of divorces, marriages end in divorce. I would argue, you know, 90% of marriages <laughs> end in divorce. So then what was it about Hillary that upset people so? It was because she was this sort of public manifestation of the fact of saying to men, yes, you can cheat. Yes, we'll get pissed off, but we're going to stay. And so you have violated the rule, if you will. The rule is you're supposed to make them think you're going to leave. And so surely if Hillary doesn't leave Bill, then I ain't going to leave my man. But now that he knows that, you know, you've shown him my hand, you know, if you will. And so the, the, I, I would condense that down to, you know, saying to Hillary Clinton, how dare you be so strong as to not do something I was too weak to do? And you've shown the hand, okay? I'm really a bad person for that because I have, I have a very strong spirit of sleep. Uh, when I get tired, I'm going to sleep. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I think it's one of the reasons I can be so productive because I don't toss and turn. I don't know what keeps me up at night, but what I do worry about, um, well, there's two levels. There's sort of just me, and then there's the world, if you will. On a personal level, the just me, I, I, I oftentimes say to my partner, Michael, it's like, you know, I realized something. Concerning a lot of things, right now, I'm the flavor of the month. And I say that out of confidence and not conceit. You know, I'm, I, I'm the flavor of the month. But I have enough sense to realize that even the longest month only lasts for 31 days. And on that 32nd day, I don't want to look up and think I wasted my time, that I was worrying about the wrong thing, that I was affecting change in the wrong way, or that what I was doing was somehow insufficient. And if I had just thought about it, I could have had a bigger impact. That's on a personal level. On a, a, on a more broad world level, um, uh, I really, it's just issues of social justice. It's just the, the fact that, you know, um, uh, th there's, there's, there's a TV show, The Actor's Studio, I think it's called, and they ask those questions at the end of the interview, and one of them is, if heaven exists um, and you make it, uh, what do you want to hear God say? Uh, my answer has always been, if heaven exists, and if I make it to the pearly gates and I bump into the, the greater being, you know, I don't want to hear great job, Juan, or you made a difference, Juan, or welcome, come on in. I don't want to hear that. I could kill us. Um, the conversation I want to have is, you know, Juan, human suffering, there was a point. Come on in, sit down, and I'll explain it to you. Uh, the best advice I think I ever received came from my grandmother, who passed away a year, maybe two years ago. And... Um, uh, uh, and I have a very, especially when I'm just, you know, don't care and feeling good, and uh, I have a very, extremely, very large, loud laugh. And my, uh, my grandmother said to me once, don't ever let him take your laugh. And I just, you know, and, 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 you know, as do all, you know, black or probably white even grandmothers who grow up in the South, you know, everything is wrapped in these sort of parables or these, you know, nothing's ever explicitly just stated, if you will. And that idea of never let them take your laugh. I mean, never let them take, never let the world take that which feeds you, which sustains you, which takes care of you, which uh, makes you uniquely who you are on the planet. Uh, that's what I took that to mean, of never let them take your laugh, uh, if you will.